Uh, three weeks ago, I had kind of an introductory uh, sermon about the parables, and then Mickey picked up on that last week. Uh, he had the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee and their prayer in the temple. Good, good message last week. I'm going to be picking up this week on a parable. It's found in three of the Gospels. Uh, the parable of the sower and the four soils, sometimes called the four soils. Um, I, I have a nice handout, wonderful handout. I got a little picture on it, a frame on it, all my points on it, and you can fill in and stuff, but it's sitting on my desk at home. So we got a generic one out there that you can grab and, and uh, use for this. Okay, so Luke 8, we're going to look at verses 4 through 15. But before we get into that, here's my morning joke. Farmer Evans, see a farmer dealing with the soil, you see, see a farmer, okay, Farmer Evans was driving his John Deere tractor along the road with a trailer full of <coughs> fertilizer, huh? Uh, Tim, a little boy of eight, was playing in his yard when he saw the farmer and asked, what do you got in your trailer? Manure, Farmer Evans replied. What are you going to do with it, Tim asked. Put it on my strawberries, answered the farmer. Good fertilizer on the strawberries. You're going to put it on the strawberries. Tim replied, you ought to come and eat with us. We put ice cream on our strawberries. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what the farmer meant with that. Okay, so let's look at this parable. Let me, a, a couple of slides here dealing with an introduction to this parable. Parable of the sower. It is a unique parable. It appears in the three synoptic gospels. John, as we mentioned several weeks ago, does not have parables, though he does have a lot of analogies, the I am's, I am the good shepherd, I am the door, those types of things. But he doesn't strictly have parables. But the other three gospels, we call them the synoptic gospels, they do. This parable appears in Matthew 13, in Mark chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 8. The wording is very similar in all three of those, slightly different on some of the verses. We're going to look at that uh, as we get into it. Um, but it seems to be very similar in all three of those Gospels. But why is this unique? Here's why it is unique. This is uh, what makes this parable unique is because after Jesus tells the crowd the parable... He gets alone with his disciples, and then he interprets the parable for them. We have another one that I'm going to pick up on next week, another parable about soil. It's going to be about the, the wheat and the tares. Um, but Jesus also interprets that one. So there were several parables that Jesus interprets. Dealing with this one, in the Mark chapter 4 passage, um, he says this, Mark chapter 4, verse 13, Jesus says this, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? This is before he gives the interpretation. The crowd has left. He told the crowd this parable. In fact, it's kind of interesting. It was along the Sea of Galilee, and the crowd got so big, it was pressing uh, into him that he got out in a boat, and he stood out in the boat while the crowd was on shore, and he preached to them, and he told them this parable from the boat out into the water. Kind of interesting. But then the crowd leaves, and Jesus says this to his disciples. He said to them, do you not understand this parable? And then he says, how then will you understand all the parables? That implies, Jesus implies that understanding the interpretation of this parable will help his disciples, will help us to understand all of the parables that he gives to us. It's, a, it's kind of a key to understanding parables. So we're going to look at both as he talked to the crowd and then his interpretation of that to the disciples, and that helps us interpret not only this parable, of course we got Jesus' inspired interpretation of this parable, but it helps us, it will help us interpret other parables in the future that we will look at as well. Okay. So here's our text. We're going to look through the text. First of all, verses 4 through 8, where Jesus tells this parable from the boat to the crowd. 
And then I skip a few verses, verses what, 9 and 10, and I pick up in verse 11 where he's alone with his disciples and he interprets the parable to his disciples. Okay, First of all, the parable. I have chosen Luke. I could have chosen Mark. I could have chosen Matthew. I kind of tried to decide which one of them I should uh which one of them I should preach from directly, but I happen to choose Luke kind of arbitrarily. They are worded, all worded very similar, and I'm going to show you some differences as we get into that between the four uh, between the three gospels. But I chose the passage from Luke. And when a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, Luke doesn't tell us that he got out in a boat, but the other two gospels, Mark and Matthew, tell us that he got out and about and he preached it, or out, out and about, how about that? Out and a boat, out in a boat, and preached it from out in a boat. Verse 5 starts the parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold, Luke tells us. Now, starting at verse 11, the preaching to the crowd has ended. The crowd has gone away. And verse 11, he says this. Now, this parable is this. He's talking to his disciples. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. This is the word of God. It landed on their hearts. And the devil comes along and takes it away. So that they may not believe and be saved. Verse 13. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have, not, have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, fall away. 14. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. The other two Gospels, Matthew and Mark, word this one a little bit differently. We'll dissect that a little bit. And as for the good soil, they are those who hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, there's that heart again, and bear fruit with patience. Okay, there's our text. Uh, this, is the, this is the Luke rendering of the text. Okay, so here's my outline. And I know, my nice nifty handout where you can fill in blanks, that's at home on my desk, but this generic one will, will, will work. I got five points on this. I have, first of all, we're going to talk about sowing the seed, and then, of course, we're going to talk about each of the individual soils, the hard ground, the stony ground, the weedy ground, and the good ground. Now notice the verses that I have with these. First, we're going to look at what Jesus said in the parable, and then for each of them, we're going to look at his uh, interpretation to his disciples of that parable. Okay, so let's look at the first one. First of all, the sower sowing the seed. Jesus said in verse 5a, the sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed... My, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, I don't have a green thumb, and I'm not real good with our lawn. Our lawn, they made a mistake when they built our subdivision, and they didn't slant the backyard far, uh, good enough that it drains away. There's a drain, three houses down, that goes down a, a city drain. Uh, but they didn't slope them. So our backyard has standing water. We tried to dig this creek out looking thing, and so the water kind of gathers in the creek. But every year I get grass. I buy some grass seed because the water has killed a bunch of the spots in the, in the lawn. And I got this thing. You, you 
you put it in the top and I got a little handle on it and and as you turn that handle, this little, uh, I call it a whirly gig, is that a word? A whirly gig goes around and it throws the seed out, throws it out, throws it out everywhere. And that's, though, in biblical times, uh, they didn't have a whirly gig in, in biblical times. Uh, they would reach into the bag and throw their seed, and they'd throw their seed, and they'd walk through the field throwing and scattering their seed as they went. And it's that the seed lands in different places as the sower goes out and sows the seed. Now the crowd sitting there, what? He's telling us a wonderful story about we're familiar with farmers going out and sowing their seed, but what's, what's he getting at? Well, Jesus interprets this for his disciples. A few verses later, he says, now the parable is this. Okay, now that seed that Jesus was talking about in his story, remember a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It has a meaning behind it. Jesus gives him the meaning of it. He says the seed is the word of God. The seed is being strewn, it's going out there. We don't know where it's going to land, but it is just being, it's being broadcast it's being thrown out there and it's going to land on different hearts who are the people who are out there sowing the word of god well if you remember the great commission um we are to go out and we are to share the gospel with others we are the people who have a great big bag of gospel seeds, and we in our lifestyle and in our speech and in our talking, we are to be spreading the good news. We are to be spreading the gospel to the world. We send missionaries out to share the gospel with countries that don't have the gospel. We have radio broadcasts. We have TV preachers. We have, most importantly, we have local churches that encourage each of us as believers to go out and share the gospel with others. The gospel message is the seed. It is our responsibility as believers to be faithful at sowing his seed. I have, when we bought the, the house, it had this in the garage. In the front of my garage, I got this, this nice bench, but under the bench there's a whole bunch of drawers and because my garage is so messy, those drawers are almost useless because you, you, I don't always have room. We got two cars parked in there. I got a folded up trailer. My bike sits in there through the winter. The snow thrower sits in there. Those drawers are almost useless because there's everything in front of them. You can't get them. But in one of those drawers, in one of those drawers, I know it's there. I don't know if I'd ever be able to find it. I have a half a bag of grass seed. It's been there. It's been there probably three, four years now. I had sown the other half of it, and I had half of this bag left, and I put it in that drawer, and it is still in that drawer three or four years later. Is grass seed good? It's dry. It should be. Is grass seed good three, four years old? No? Is it any good anymore? Isn't that what we do with the gospel sometimes? We just stick it in the drawer and we don't share it with others. That grass seed doesn't do any good sitting in that drawer. It needs to get out. It needs to be thrown onto the soils in order to be rooted in the soil and to grow into grass. We need to be faithful at sowing the seeds of the gospel. Each time that we witness to somebody, share God's word with somebody, or we preach the word of God, it falls on people's hearts. We meet different people. We might share with different people. And you know what? We, I'm going to say this, I think, in the next part, this next part, we are not responsible for whether they accept it or not. You know, we can't grab them by the horse collar and, and, and shake them up and say, you need to accept the gospel or I'll punch your face in. You know, we can't do that. I remember, I remember reading an uh, evangelistic book, um, How to Win People to the Lord. And, um, and it was really kind of interesting because it talked about how, 
Uh, and when you ask them, do you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? Then you kind of put your hand on their shoulder and you bow your head because then you kind of intimidate them into bowing their head. And then you say, repeat after me. And then they, they are sitting there, well, okay, you know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if that person really is meaning it from their heart, or, you know. <laughs> we are not responsible for their heart. We are responsible for sharing. I think that's what I got. We are responsible for spreading the seed. And as this parable clearly tells us, there are different hearts out there. Different people are going to reject it. Different people aren't going to like you because you shared the gospel with them. Some people are going to be fake Christians. Some people are going to be real Christians and get established and grow in their Christian life. The sowers of the seed is us. All right, point number two, the hard ground. Jesus talks about one of the grounds. He says this as he's telling the parable in the second part of verse 5. He says, some fell along the path, uh, along the field there would always be an area where the people had to cross the field. They had to walk out to the field, and it was uh, along, usually along the side. It was hard. It was trampled down. Nothing usually ever grew there because it was always being trampled on. When I grew up on a farm, we had a place for the tractor to run alongside the field. We didn't want to be running over corn or whatever, you know, so we left driveways for the tractor to get out there. There was a path. Some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. Why was it trampled? Because, because people walked on the path. I was reading. I'm not, I'm not very good. Like I said, I'm not very good at growing my grass. But they say when those tender young shoots of new grass come up, you're not supposed to walk on it. Right? Am I right? You people who know about lawns and stuff, if you put it in the path and people walk there, that grass dies because it's along the path. Some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. And then it says, and the birds of the air devoured it. It's kind of interesting. The day after I go out there with my bird seed, and I, of course I got my whirly gig and I throw it all over the yard. I look out there a day later and I got a whole bunch of birds on the lawn just feeding away. They say, thank you, Pastor Herrick, for feeding us, and they're just devouring that grass seed right out of my, out of my yard. i got to get a scarecrow or something out there to get them out of there. The, the birds come along, and they devour. Well, that was an interesting story that Jesus told the crowd. Then he interprets it to his disciples. He says this, verse 12. He says, the ones along the path are those who have heard... The seed fell on their hard heart, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they may not believe and be saved. There's a good evangelical, evangelistic term, be saved. Well, the devil came along, plucked that word of God so that they could not be saved. Well, a couple of things here uh, that we see on that ground. One of them is that the ground is hard. It's trampled underfoot. Some people's hearts are hard. They hear the gospel and they say, Fooey, I don't want to have anything to do with that. We see in the Old Testament, Pharaoh. Remember the story of Moses and Pharaoh? Pharaoh hardened his heart to the word of God as, far as Moses came to him. He had a hard heart. There are people with a hard heart. People who will not accept the word of God because their hearts are hard. We are not responsible for them. We cannot loosen up their heart. We can't do anything about that. They need to believe. Second point is, is that the devil comes and takes the word of God away from their memory so they can't be saved. The devil don't want that word sitting there. The book of Hebrews says, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. The word of God is powerful. Satan says, oh, that word of God is sitting there. That guy's heard it. I better get his mind off of that and robs the word of God from him so he doesn't begin to think about his spiritual condition as lost and separated from God. I want to ask you something. 
We're not like this. Our hearts, I hope this is true with everyone here, our hearts have received the word of God. But you know something? I think Satan tries to do the same thing in our lives. Because the word of God is going to mold us and it's going to shape us. It's going to produce fruit for the Lord in our lives. Satan don't want that. So Satan comes along and tries to steal the word of God from our hearts. And we don't remember it. We don't take it seriously. We take it, you know, flippantly. Uh, sometimes I got the, in the morning, I get up. Uh, first thing I do is I walk, first thing I do is walk to the coffee maker, my Keurig, and I make myself a cup of coffee. Then I come in and I turn channel 8 on to watch what's the weather going to be today. And then I pull out my phone and I have my devotions. Well, sometimes Terry DeBoer, she's the weather lady at Wood TV, she comes on at the same time as I have uh, pressed my, I go to uh, our daily bread and I could read it, but I'm too lazy in the morning to read it. My eyes don't focus very well in the morning. So I press their little uh, button and they read it to me. That's how lazy I am. I gotta have my devotions read to me, you know. So I press that and I'm listening to that and then Terry DeBoer comes on at the same time with the weather and I want to hear the weather of the day. And so I kind of listening to my phone and then I look at her and I look at my phone, I look at her, I look at my phone, I look at her. And I'm getting the weather for the day. And then my, and then my, our daily bread uh, audio, it gets all done. They run through this little story, kind of like a parable, a little story to help you remember. And then they read the scripture passage and then they close in prayer and it gets all done. And you know what? I know what the weather's going to be for the day, <laughs> but I didn't catch what was read from the Word of God that morning in my devotions. I said, wait a minute. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not good at multitasking. We think we're good at multitasking, but yeah, we really aren't good at multitasking. I either got to listen to Terry DeBoer and find out the importance of what the weather is going to be. She says, we have a 50% chance of either rain or sun today. That, isn't, that a, isn't that a good definite... The forecast, you know, and I have missed the word of God. We sometimes later in the day, I'm hustling about and then I stop and I think, oh, let's see here. I read, I read a passage from the Bible this morning. I had my devotions. What was it? Oh, let's see. What was it? Oh, I can't remember what it was. And it's gone somewhere in there. Satan has come and has busy my mind so much that I forget the word of God. I think we all do that. We need to be careful. We need to remember that God's word in our life is there to change us, to mold us, to transform us. We were singing that song about the joy of the Lord. I was saying before the, the, the sermon today how I'd gotten a, a, a tooth pulled this week and it hasn't been a fun experience. During the day, I get along, got some Tylenol, you know, and I get through. But in the evening, it starts to boom, 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 and it starts to throb. And I think about, you know what, John? You need to practice the joy of the Lord. I don't want to practice the joy of the Lord. My tooth hurts, you know, and, and I, I'm fighting, battling with myself. I'm ornery with Lord. Just ask Laurel. I'm ornery with people around me because my tooth is throbbing. And the Word of God says we need to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Don't let Satan steal the word of God from your life. All right, nextly, nextly, is that a word? The second ground, point number three, the stony ground. First in verse six, Jesus says to the crowd, and some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And then he interprets it down in verse 13. He says this to his disciples. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, they receive it with joy, but these have no root. They have no root. That is important. They have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, they fall away. Surveys say that 50% or greater in the United States claim to be Christians. But I want to tell you something. If persecution against 
Christianity broke down, uh, broke out across our United States as it is in other parts of the world, I think that number would drop dramatically. I think the percent of people claiming to be Christians would drop because there's a lot of people claiming to be Christians who really aren't Christians. And it says, and in time of testing, they fall away. They heard the word, they receive it with joy. For a while they seem to be a Christian, but they really have no inward, born-again heart change, just outward appearance, and they fall away. Let me show you an interesting cross-reference to this. First of all, they have no roots. I said here, uh, they have heard the gospel and seem to accept it at first, but it is only outward. They have no inner heart change. They have no roots. Then tribulation causes them to give up on the Christian faith. They really were not saved in the first place. Let me show you something. Cross-reference. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. This is interesting. Notice what John says here, verse 19. I know, I've plucked the one verse out of the context here, but notice what it says. It says, they, talking about a group that had left the Christian faith, they went out from us. So in other words, they were saying outwardly that they were Christians. They had joined with the Christians where John was. They were pretending, I might say, to be Christians. But they went out from us. But they were not of us. See that? There's a distinction. Though they met regularly with the local church, they would come Pretty soon, they dropped away. They went out from us. Why? Because inwardly, they had never been born again in the first place. They were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Uh, John's got kind of funny wording there, but he's, he, he, he describes two groups, the us, who are truly born again believers, and then the they who went out from us who really weren't born again. For a while they pretended to be Christians, and then they went out from us. It proved that they were not part of us on the inside, truly born again, because they left the Christian faith. We need to make sure that we truly are born again. We need to grow our roots deep in the Lord. Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Verse 3 says, He shall be... As a, this person, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever they do prospers. Why does their leaf not wither and why are they able to grow fruit? Because their roots are by the stream of water. Their roots get nourishment. Their roots get life, giving stuff that makes fruit grow. Okay? Good cross-reference. So the second ground, some people, the, the gospel may fall on their hearts. It's kind of interesting. You know, at, at some of the big, large crusades, uh, at the end, when, say a Billy Graham crusade, at the end when the Just As I Am is singing, um, hundreds of people get up and leave and walk down front. And studies have been done on those people that have come forward at the conclusion of those evangelistic crusades. Studies have been done a year later. I think it's about 25% of them are involved in a local church and attending regularly. 75% of them have just dropped away. Isn't that interesting? Huh? I think they kind of fell in this area, that they got emotionally involved in the evangelistic crusade, but they truly did not accept Jesus as their Savior. The weedy ground. Verse 7, Jesus says to the crowd, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and it, uh, with it and choked it. 
And as for what fell, and now he's interpreting in verse 14 to his disciples, and as far as what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Isn't that interesting? Um, I've compared all three of the Gospels here. Um, they say this a little bit differently. Uh, Luke says they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. Okay, that's what Luke says. Mark says, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. By the way, that word cares in Mark here, but the cares of the world, it doesn't mean the things that we, we kind of think about, oh, I got a lot of cares in my life, meaning I got a lot of worries in my life. That isn't what this word means. This word means uh, they have a love for the world. They have a caring for the world. The world is a high priority in their life. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, isn't that an interesting word to go along with riches. We always think, oh, if I only had a little bit more money, I would be happy and life would be much better. No, it wouldn't. That's the deceitfulness of riches. It tries to make you think that if you just had a little more of it, everything would be better. One of the highest suicide rates other than teens, one of the highest suicide rates are among the rich and famous. They don't find happiness in life from fame and wealth and riches. There are deceitfulness of riches. And the desires for other things, covetousness, these things choke out, they choke out fruit from being produced in their life. Matthew says, but the cares of the world, and again, Matthew says, the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. So those, this verse is slightly different, you see, in the four Gospels. Real things in life that cause a lack of fruit. I read about this. Western Michigan, uh, you know, you get up there on Fruit Ridge, you get out uh, between here and Muskegon and heading north. We have a lot of fruit in West Michigan. Some years aren't so good for the fruit farmers. The crop isn't very good. There's a number of things. I read this article. There's a number of things that cause a lack of fruit. Poor tree growth, poor soil, and there's no fertilizer. Uh, blossoms freeze from a, a late frost in Michigan, you know, uh, that seems to happen. Um, drought, maybe through the summer, there's a lack of water. And uh, here's another one that this article said. Sometimes the trees aren't pruned correctly and they don't bear fruit because they haven't been pruned. They just grow wildly and they're not pruned. Um, they're too close to gather. Sometimes there is a lack of sunlight. So these were all things from that article. Now, I was going to kind of allegorize all of these and try to make all of these fit in, but I, that's, that, that wouldn't have been good. But these are genuinely, for fruit farmers here in West Michigan, things that cause them to have and the fall, when they get their crop in, have a lack of fruit. Well, how about Christians? Well, there are things that cause us not to be producing fruit in our lives as well. Cares of this world, Matthew and Mark mentioned that. Cares and riches, Luke says. The deceitfulness of riches, Mark and Matthew both use that term the pleasures of life, and then Mark says the desires for other things. You know something? When we as believers have these kinds of things in our life, it causes our fruit for the Lord, to the glory of the Lord, it causes our fruit to be stunted. We don't produce the kind of fruit we could because we have these in our lives. I think there's a very strong warning there for us. All right, lastly, the good ground. Verse 8, Jesus said to the crowd, And some fell on good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. You got one bag of seed, you go out, you plant your wheat, 
And in the fall, when you harvest it, you got a hundred bags of wheat. It has produced a whole lot more. Verse 15, Jesus is interpreting it. He says, as for that in the good soil, they are those who hear the word, hold it fast. And, and then Luke says, in an honest and good heart. I like that phrase. We need to have an honest and good heart whenever we come to the word of God. And bear fruit with patience. Fruit doesn't immediately come. It will be grown by the Spirit in your life as time goes on. All right, Luke mentions the heart. Hold it fast in an honest and good heart, he says. I like that phrase. Uh, it is a condition of the heart that helps fruit to grow when we listen and to or read the Word of God, we need to have an honest and open heart willing to do what the Word tells us to do. Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Now there's a lot in this prayer. He says, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened. We need to have a heart that is willing to accept the Word of God and do what it says. Our heart condition is what will produce fruit. All right, Matthew mentions this. Here's another point on that fourth soil. Matthew 13, verse 23 says, As for what was sown on the good ground, this is the one who hears the Word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in some, in one case, a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Matthew gives this, this, this kind of delineation. Okay? He says not everybody is going to produce a hundredfold. Some may produce sixtyfold. Some may produce thirtyfold. As long as you produce fruit. I have said this. We are different from each other. Alan is tall and handsome and, and a nice guy. Pastor Herrick is fat and overweight and ugly, and, and, and we're all different, huh? It says here, the 30 foal is not rebuked because it has produced less than a hundred foal. I said here, we are all given different personalities. We are given different gifts. We are given different situations in life. We just need to be concerned about sowing the seed and growing fruit Depending on our circumstances, depending on our personalities, we need to produce fruit. Some will produce a hundredfold, some will produce sixtyfold, some will produce thirtyfold. We just need to be faithful in producing fruit for the Lord. Our job is to be faithful in how the Lord has enabled us. All right, I'm done at the end here. We need to be careful not to have hard hearts. We need to be careful to not allow hard times to turn us from the Lord. As some, some people turned, around, turned away from the Lord when hard times came. We need to be careful not to allow riches and the pleasures of life to keep us from producing fruit to the glory of the Lord. I think in the United States that this is what has infected Christianity. Is our standard of living has affected our lives of faithfulness for the Lord. We need to have an honest heart and be producing fruit for the Lord with our lives. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for this parable. Thank you for interpreting it for us. Father, may our hearts be good soil. May our hearts be open and honest to you. And may we produce fruit that we might glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless your word to us today in Jesus' name. Amen.